Let me just give you a warm welcome this morning. It's good to have you in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Boy, does it look beautiful here today. I, we had so much going on here at the church this past week, and I see other cars pulling in and things like that. But let me just say this. Thank you to each and every one who had a part in decorating. We, I know we had three individuals, uh, especially, that were here this week, and I think they spent at least... 18 hours apiece just decorating the church. And so let me just say a thank you to Diane and Charlie and Lois for doing a great job and many, many others. It looks beautiful around here, and I, and I praise the Lord for it. Let me also say this. If you have your bulletin in front of you, can I just call your attention out to a number of things? Inside there is a, is a Christmas brochure, all right, to invite somebody else to the upcoming um, just services that we have. The titles of the messages are on the back of, of, of that brochure that you can take a look at and uh, invite somebody to come with you. 86% of people who come to a church come because they're invited by a family member, or a friend, uh, etc. So I just want to encourage you to be inviting other folks to come. Also, for those who had a, a part in working in the yard this past week and, and helping to paint the library and, and other things, a special thank you. Really appreciate it. So many other things are, are going on with the door adjustments here on the property, the roof, and uh, many, many other things. And, and I just want to say thank you. Uh, you. You all are having a great impact in revitalizing the property here that we have. And I just want to say Thank you to you so much. We've got a number of folks that are sick, all right, that are not with us today. I know Joy Jackson is not here with us today. Don, Donald's home today and others that are, are not here. And I just want to encourage you to pray for one another. Intercessory prayer, I was, Rex was just talking about that in our, our brief prayer time that we have before the morning service today. And just interceding for one another. The message this morning is going to be on prayer. And I'd like to open this service in a word of prayer this morning. Father, we come before your presence today. We want to extol your name. We want to lift you high today. We want to praise you because you are our God. You are our King. Like Psalm 145 and verse 1 says. What a wonderful Savior you are. And we're gathered together with brothers and sisters in Christ, and we're thankful that we're here. We pray that you would meet with us. Lord, may you receive from our lips the praise that is due your holy name. Thank you for being our God and for being a God who hears prayer. And Lord, today we pray that in everything, everything, you might receive our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to start off our service this morning by singing Tell It to Jesus, hymn number 433 in your songbook. We're going to be singing the first, second, and the third verses of this song, Tell It to Jesus. Would you stand with me at this time as we sing together? Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You're no longer such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Do the tears fall from your cheeks unbidden? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Have you sins that to men's eyes are hidden? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's so known. You a friend or brother, tell it to Jesus alone. Do you fear the gathering clouds of sorrow? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. 
Jesus. Are you anxious? What shall be tomorrow? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. And then hymn number 153, He is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme through the ages rung. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world e'er sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Oh, my sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. On the second verse, we're going to leave off the current chorus and just go right into the third verse. So hang with me as we sing on the second verse. Tis the grandest theme in the earth or main. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal strain. Tis the grandest theme tell the world again. Our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme, let the tidings roll to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Look to God in faith, He will make thee whole. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Oh, my sin to him for rest our God is able to deliver thee as Pastor Damon comes we're going to be seated at this time and turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 12 verses 1 through 19 Good morning. Acts chapter 12. Hear the word of the Lord. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter. Also, This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, 
Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hands to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the uh, assimilation of his word, his powerful truth and wisdom for our lives. Heavenly Father, may we be doers of your word and not hearers only. Father, we pray that these stories would be embedded in our hearts, that we would see you more clearly, and that we would know you more dearly. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be singing in our songbooks this morning, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. We're going to sing just the first and the third verse. On the second verse, I think we'll give a chance to greet one another this morning. It's good to have you here. Why don't you stand with me as we sing this song? It's a very familiar song to most of us here this morning. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Take a verse and just greet one another this morning. heavy laden are we weak and heavy laden covered with a load of care precious Savior still our refuge take it to the Lord in prayer do thy friends despise for saving and shield me, thou wilt find a soulless there. Thank you so much. You may be seated this morning. Lord, though. 
each thought and action hope, anxiety and fear. How can I hide from thee? Can darkness hide iniquity? Oh, how can I unfaithful be when you are very ushers to come forward at this time. We'll wait on the Lord for a word of prayer. As we prepare our hearts to uh, give our offering this morning, let's uh, bow before our Lord in thankfulness. Our Heavenly Father, we worship you this morning. We come out of the world into your sanctuary to be in your presence and to be ever grateful for your mercy and your grace, your power, your awesome creation. Father, thank you for this life. Thank you for the hope of eternal life through Christ our Lord. As you bless us with so many things, we just pray that our offerings back to you this morning would be pleasing in your sight. And we pray that the ministry of this church would glorify you in outreach and presence in this community. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Janet. I want to invite you to open your Bibles this morning with me to Acts chapter 12 this morning. If you look up on the platform here, to my left here and your left is the word pray. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You know, we put that first for a reason when we hung these banners. Our church should be marked by prayer. This should be a house that is called the house of prayer. This is where God's people come collectively together and seek the Lord in prayer. You know, the disciples looked at the Lord and said, Lord, teach us to pray. They didn't ask him, Lord, teach us to preach. Lord, teach us how to make visits. But Lord, teach us to pray. Psalms is the prayer book of the Bible. If you want to learn how to pray, you you read the Psalms. The Lord's Prayer, in a nutshell, tells you what to pray. But the Psalms really tells you how to pray. Prayer is not so much turning to God to get something from the hand of God, but it's to be with someone, to be with God. And so the psalmist cries out in Psalm chapter 145 and verse 1, it says, I will extol you, my God and King. Psalm 25 and verse 14 says, The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear Him. Some translations may have secret counsel or the word secret put in there in the meaning of the word sod. It's a, it's a confidential discussion. Don't you do that with your friends? With your close friends, You share your secrets. You share your confidences with them. So Psalm 25 tells us that we can have a relationship with God, an intimate friendship with God. Become close friends with God. Aristotle never believed that at all. He never believed that you could be a friend of a God. But we can become friends of God. Exodus 33 and verse 11, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. 2 Chronicles 27, Abraham, your friend. Isaiah 41 and verse 8, But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. We are made in the image of the triune God. Talk about a triune God, three distinct persons in the Godhead, great friends, relationship with one another. And what we find in this narrative, as we find it here in Acts chapter 12, this is about fellowship. This is about relationship. And I think if you miss that when it comes to prayer, you've missed a notable thing. God wants a relationship with you. Luke is switching from the events that took place just north um, as we're introduced to them in chapter 11 here, and we finished up last week in Antioch. There was great persecution uh, that was going to take place in Jerusalem, but there's a famine that's taking place, and they take up a collection, and they send it down to Jerusalem by the hand of two men, Barnabas, the son of encouragement, and then the other one being Saul. And then right on the heels of that comes chapter 12 and verse number 1. Now Luke skillfully weaves in this section the rejection of the Jews to Jesus, their Messiah. He does this over and over again as we've been traveling through the book of Acts. This animosity here explodes and sets the stage for the first missionary journey that's going to take place in Acts chapter 13. But chapter 12, we see the cold-hearted enmity that Herod has against the church 
as reflected in the Jews. He wants to court favor with them. And so this persecution is going to come on the scene once again in Jerusalem. Now here in these verses, we see the destructive power of Herod. However, we also see the saving power of prayer. And that's what I love about this text. First of all, the persecution against the Jerusalem church. Notice with me in verse 1. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. Now, who is this Herod? This would be the grandson of Herod the Great. Remember, Herod the Great reigned from 37 B.C. all the way to 4 B.C. This is that same Herod the Great. He killed two of his sons in 7 B.C. The father of Herod Antipas I here, his father in 7 B.C. was murdered by his grandfather. Remember, Herod had nine wives, many sons. Matter of fact, Caesar says it's better to be a pig in, for, for, um, for Herod the Great than one of his own children. He made that claim. He also, just before he passed away in 4 B.C., he killed, I think five days before he died, he killed another one of his sons. Well, Herod Antipas, this is the one who the Bible is talking about here in Acts chapter 12. He's the grandson of Herod the Great. We're introduced to him. And it says about that time. Now, Luke is deliberately vague here for us. Scholars, some of them dispute the exact order of chapters 10 through 12 here, but what we can be certain of is that the church has been growing. And there had been a growing animosity between the Orthodox Jews and the Jewish believers, the Christians. The evangelistic fervor of the new Jewish converts to Christianity. The Gentiles were being allowed into the church and they were not becoming proselytes to Judaism. So they didn't have to be circumcised. They weren't baptized, baptized into Judaism as well. And this was historically unheard of. And the Orthodox Jews could not see the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant at all. And Herod wants to curry favor with the Jewish population there in Jerusalem. And those who were law-keeping, those who were temple-sacrificing Jews there in Jerusalem. And so we see here in verse number 1, about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. Now, Herod Antipas I was very popular among the Jews. If you track the history of this king, he was very popular. He sought to curry favor with them. Matter of fact, Josephus, a first century Roman historian, writes, he was humane to foreigners and made them sensible of his liberality, gentle and compassionate in temper, Accordingly, he loved to live continually in Jerusalem. Now, he would leave Jerusalem shortly after this and travel back up to Caesarea Maritime, where he lived most of the time, but he loved to be in Jerusalem. He was a Herodian, and uh, he loved to be in that city. At some point in his reign, he decides to go after the church. He executes James. Notice in verse number one, he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. We're not sure exactly how he killed him. If he would have killed him uh, the Roman way, he would have beheaded James. If he killed him a Jewish way, he would have been thrust through with a spear or with a sword. In this case, the text clearly indicates that it was a sword. But notice the term violent hands. The Greek word that's used there means to injure, to harm, to hurt, to mistreat, to afflict, to do harm. Matter of fact, the entire Herodian clan had the same evil spirit as Herod Antipas I here in our story. He laid violent hands on them to do evil. And he's going after people who belong to the church. Jesus said, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Suffer persecution. Now this is James. 
not the half-brother of our Lord, who wrote the epistle or the letter of James. This is James, the son of Zebedee. You remember his brother was John? They were called the sons of thunder, right? This, these were two fishermen. This is an apostle, the apostle James. To, let me just say this. This is the first and only apostle in the text of Scripture that we have who is martyred. Remember what you had to be to be an apostle? To be an apostle, you had to have followed Jesus during his entire earthly ministry. Beginning with Jesus' baptism to Jesus' ascension back up into heaven. You had to have followed him. We know that from Acts chapter 1, verses 21 and verse number 22. The apostle had to have seen Jesus after the resurrection. Acts chapter 1 and verse 22 tells us that. And he had to be appointed by the Lord himself. Verses 24 through 25 of Acts chapter 1. So that's what it meant to be an apostle. It means, means to be a sent one, right? The apostles. And to have the office of an apostle, you had to have three basic responsibilities. Number one, they laid the foundation of the church. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 tells us that. Number two, to receive and declare the revelation of God's word. That's what they did, according to Acts chapter 11 and verse 28. Chapter 21, verses 10 and 11. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 5. And number three, they gave confirmation of that word through signs and wonders and miracles. And they had the gift of being apostle. So they could perform many wonderful works. Remember, we've talked about some of those already in the book of Acts. Healing a lame man, for instance. Raising someone from the dead like Dorcas. This was an office, the office of an apostle. The basic meaning of apostle is simply one who's sent on a mission. Now, in its primary meaning, in the most technical sense... Apostle is used in the New Testament only of the twelve, including Matthias, who replaced Judas, and of Paul, who is an apostle to, the Bible says, to the Gentiles. Remember that? Galatians 1, 15 through 17. 1 Corinthians 15, 7 through 9 declares that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 5. You had to be chosen directly by God and witnessed the resurrection of Christ. Acts chapter 1, 21 through 24. Now, this was the office of an apostle. Now, the term apostle is used in a more general sense of other men in the early church. Matter of fact, Barnabas later would be called an apostle in Acts chapter 14 and verse 4. Silas and Timothy in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 6. And a few other outstanding leaders were called apostles, or men who were sent on a mission. That's the idea. Like when you get into Romans 16 and verse 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 23, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 25. So you had this, these men who were apostles of Jesus Christ. They were the twelve. Apostles of Jesus Christ, that office of apostolic leaders. And then you had this second group who were called apostles. But the true apostles in the second group were literally called messengers, apostoi, stoloi, of the churches, like in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 23, whereas the 13 were apostles, the Bible says, of Jesus Christ. You'll read that like in Galatians chapter 1 in verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 in verse 1. So there were two distinct groups, but neither group were self-perpetuating. Let me just say that again. Neither group were self-perpetuating. Now James is one of these apostles He's one of the three disciples that were in the inner circle of Jesus, the closest to the Lord Jesus. 
Remember when Jesus went up on the Mount of Transfiguration, guess who he chose to go with him? James was one of them, according to Matthew chapter 17 and verse 1. He witnessed Jesus' agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible clearly tells us, in Mark chapter 14, verses 33 through 35. Maybe Jesus' agony in the Garden of Gethsemane prepared James for his martyrdom even. We don't know. But he's one of the two sons of thunder, according to Mark chapter 3 and verse 17. This is the only death of an apostle that's recorded for us. And he is the second man who's been martyred in the book of Acts following Stephen. Now that was years earlier. We flash forward ahead, maybe eight to ten years. And now we're in the same city, the city of Jerusalem. And guess what's happening? More persecution. Now, this describes the murder of James here. He says, he laid his violent hands on him to do evil. So this is an execution. Herod takes his life. Remember what Hebrews says? By faith, says the writer of Hebrews, some escaped the edge of the sword, and by faith others were killed with the sword. Remember that in Hebrews eleven thirty four 34 and 37? Well, James didn't escape the edge of the sword. However, we're introduced to another apostle who does escape that. And that's what our author's intended to give us here. Now, Herod's approval rating skyrocketed after he killed James. Notice what it says here. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And then verse number three, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also, This was during the days of unleavened bread. So at the very same time of year where our Lord's death was taken, all right, literally given up, he gave up his life, right? At this very same time of year, though it was years later, the same thing is happening. And he goes ahead, and as we've read, he arrests Peter and he puts him in prison. Now, for, it, it, it's interesting how uh, the author lays it out here, Luke lays it out for us here, four groups of four soldiers each are going to guard Peter. Josephus tells us that they're going to take three hour uh, time spans during the course of that 24 hours. So each of those four soldiers would serve twice a day. They usually changed the guard every three hours. Why? So the men had to stay alert. And that's what they did. So 16 soldiers are going to guard the Apostle Peter in a 24-hour period, taking a three-hour section and then another three-hour section later on. That's what's laid out for us here in this text. Notice what it says in verse 3. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was the, during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads. Each squad had four soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So during that eight-day period, he was not going to kill Peter at all. That would have greatly offended the Jews during that day and age. So he's holding Peter. He's incarcerated. He's chained to one soldier on either side of him, and then two others are standing sentry at the door. Okay? That's that's the picture that Luke gives for us here. Their watch would change every three hours. They were guarding him during Passover. Now, here's a lesson for us. God sees your trials. Look at what happens. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now, it's interesting here. He says in verse 4, intending after the pastor to bring him out to the people. The idea there is Herod Antipas, he wanted to have a quick trial and do the same thing that he did to James, to Peter. 
On that very night, this is what's going to happen here. God's going to deliver this man from prison. On that very night, God sees our trials. God, God controls our life. God allowed Herod to kill James, but God wasn't through with Peter yet. And so Peter's going to survive this. He kept the same king from harming Peter. Now, it's the throne of God that rules all things. If you're, if you're looking at the Middle East, if you're looking at Europe, if you're looking at Southeast Asia and the United States and say, everything is haywire. Who's in control of all this? I can tell you who's in control. God is. He's sovereign over everything. It is the throne in heaven that was truly in control. And we see it here in this narrative before us. God is still on His throne. God is still in control. And God will carry out His purposes and plans always. Let's look at God's pattern for deliverance. God's pattern for deliverance is prayer. God often waits to the last moment to answer prayer and deliver. That's what verse 6 is about. About Now, when Herod was about to bring him out, in other words, it's, it's getting close to the end of Passover. About that time, he's about to bring him out on that very night. God waits to that very night, the last time that he could bring him out before Herod brought him to trial and, and to death. At that very time, that very night, God sends an angel by the way, this is a supernatural deliverance. Peter is secure. He is well guarded. By the way, it's interesting what Peter's doing here. Did you notice that? In verse number 6, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. You say, I've read this a million times. Yeah, maybe God will let you read it in a fresh way this morning. Here's this guy bound by two chains, being well guarded. And what happens according to verse 5? But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now we're introduced to Mary's home, as Pastor Damon read earlier. We're introduced to Mary's home. Mary was a very wealthy woman, that home, according to archaeologists, have told us that that home would have probably fitted maybe 40, 50, or 60 people. That's not what our text is telling us, is it? Our text is telling us that prayer for him was made by God by the church. Now, where was the church at this place in Jerusalem? We know, according to chapter 4, at least 5,000 men had been saved and were part of that New Testament church there in Jerusalem. So that would have been anywhere between maybe 10 by the time or 15,000 members of that church. And they were praying. Prayer was being loose to God. We've seen the urgency of the situation, right? What is the church do doing during this, this Passover season time? They are praying earnestly. James, that, that must have really jolted the church when the apostle James was, was martyred, and now they have Peter. And so prayer is being loosed by this church, and they're praying, and they're praying earnestly, fully aware that after this time, it would be too late. Now remember, they had prayed before, and the place that they prayed in, the Bible said, was shaken in Acts chapter 4. We studied that. Here in Acts chapter 5 and verse 19, remember that God had sent an angel, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought out the apostles from prison. So they had been incarcerated before, and an angel had delivered them, sent by God miraculously. And now the church again in Jerusalem and throughout that in houses, they're praying. They are praying for Peter to be released. Let me just say this. Isn't it so satisfying to turn from our own limitations to a God who has absolutely no limitations? That's what the church is doing. That's what prayer is about, right? 
So the church had already witnessed God releasing, and they're praying. Why? Because prayer changes circumstances. Prayer changes things. Now, this is a prayer of urgency as we're introduced to it in verse number five. But earnest prayer was made by him. The word that's used here is the word that could be even considered continuously without ceasing. It expresses fervency. These people did not stop praying for Peter to be released, for God to do a work in Peter's life while he was there in prison. They were moving God to do great things, entirely given over to God in their praying. Don't you love that verse, John 14 and verse 13? Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Have you ever looked at that verse and said, whatever? God, do you really mean that? Whatever I ask, whatever? Are you serious about that, God? Did God really mean that, whatever? Look at how the end of the verse is. It's, 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 it, the, the end of the verse is kind of like an avalanche onto that word, whatever. It's a huge ending that we have here, right? You can think of prayers that won't get answered because they don't glorify the Son, right? God, please put my competitor out of business. Well, that's a prayer that we know won't get answered, right? Because it's not God glorifying. It, it doesn't please the Son. The back end of this verse just flows over like a tidal wave onto that whatever. So our prayers have to be God-centered, and they have to be Christ-exalting. Prayer is intentional, conveying of a message to God from my heart to His heart. Did you catch that? That's what prayer is. It is not communicating with God. That is not what prayer is at all. We don't describe it that way. The Bible never describes it like that. I speak to God and God speaks to me. Never speaks about that in the Bible at all. That is not prayer. God never describes His communicating to me by the word prayer. Now that might ruffle your feathers a little bit, but you can't show me one text in Scripture that tells us that. The Bible never calls God's communication to us prayer. Never. We call His communication to us revelation. We call His communication to us illumination. We call His communication to us the Word of God. Right? Now, I use that phrase there. Prayer is an intentional conveying of a message to God from my heart to His heart. That's what prayer is. And I use that word intentional for a reason. Because we are constantly communicating to God. Are we not? We communicate to God by how we use our time. We communicate to God by the way we use our talents. We communicate to God in so many different ways, right? Right? Sometimes we're communicating to God, God, you're not important to me. Hey, listen, some people are not in church today. They're, they're watching football at home. And they're communicating to God, God, you are not important to me. Hebrews 10.25 says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. They need to be in God's house, worshiping God. That's God's commandment to them. If you love me, keep my commandments. And so some people are communicating, God, God, you're not important to me. People are doing this all day long by the way they act. I do this all the way, all day long by the way I talk sometimes, by the way I use my time. God, you're not important to me. God is not relevant to this situation. Don't we communicate to God like that? Sometimes we do, or, or God, you don't even exist. 
We're in the middle of a wondering whether or not we should do this or go with this person or do this thing, and we don't even stop and pray. God, lead me in my heart what I should do. Show me the path forward. We don't even stop and even acknowledge God in our lives. So that is why I use the word intentional. So here's a group of believers in the city of Jerusalem, maybe 10, 15,000 people that are intentionally communicating to God in earnest prayer. Here's a group of believers that are intentionally conveying a message to God from their hearts about Peter. They're concerned about Peter. Earnest prayer. Now, how do you think they prayed? I think probably a lot of different things. I don't want to speculate, but I have to believe that some of them, at least out of that massive group of church that was there in Jerusalem, were pleading with God, God, deliver Peter. We saw you do it back in Acts chapter 4 before with the apostles, how you delivered them by an angel. God, do it again. And they're pleading with him. Or maybe, God, give Peter boldness. Remember earlier in the chapter, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And the church prayed for boldness after they were released from prison. So maybe they're praying for boldness as well. Prayer that pleases God, friends, is intentional. It is specific. And here in our text, it says, but earnest prayer for him, speaking about Peter, was made to God in the church. Prayer that pleases God takes God's will into account. We're taught that, aren't we? We're taught to pray by Jesus. Father, not my will, but thine being done. He says, when he taught his disciples to pray, our Father which is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we want the will of God to be done in every situation in our lives. Prayer that pleases God, the whatever is for his glory. Prayer that pleases God is persistent. It doesn't give up. They have been praying possibly for, for days on end. And, and look at the text before us. Notice what it says here. And behold, in verse 7, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. Now, one writer that I was reading uh, comments on this text in particular here and he says that this was probably between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning. A.T. Robertson makes that comment. I, I don't know if I could be that dogmatic or not. I'm not sure what time it was. The text doesn't seem to indicate for us. But I noticed that word, and behold. Now, whenever you see that, like in verse 7, you know what God's preparing your hearts for? gold nuggets of truth. He's going to strew them out before you, and you better get the behold here. Because it's something wonderful, something special is going to happen after the behold. Every time you see it in Scripture. I always, when I get to those beholds, I underline them, or I highlight them in my Bible, because I better be looking for gold nuggets here. And this is earnest prayer that's, that's being lifted up, and uh, prayer that pleases God keeps on working, keeps on putting forth energy to, to get the petition answered. Psalm 66 and verse 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So this is a righteous people that are praying, that are God-centered, they're God-glorifying, they're seeking the will of God in their lives, and they're pouring out their heart. This is the prayer that pleases God. This is the prayer that, that, that shakes things up, that, that gets God to, to look at and to acknowledge and for God to come on the scene and for God to do great God things in our lives. Earnest prayer. The etymology of this word literally means to boil hot, to boil over, to, to be glowing, to be furious. We get the idea of impassioned. 
Hey, how do you kiss your spouse? Or is it, or is it passionate? Tell you what, you kiss her impassioned. I'll tell you what, or you kiss him impassioned. Whoa! The temperature in the room just comes up, right? Right? I'm, I'm t- telling you what, this is the idea. The, the, the literally means, this word literally means to stretch out and to strain. It's literally what it means. This idea of, of being earnest prayer. Prayer must be intense. It must be fervent. It must be earnest. It's not flippant. It begins with truly understanding to whom you pray, and God wants us to participate in what He does. In the early church, talk to God. They pleaded with God. They wrestled in prayer with God, and that's what they're doing here on this very evening. They are pouring their hearts out to God. This was a focused prayer meeting with the goal of the liberation of Peter. Now, how would you pray? By the way, persecution can often prompt prayer. God's doing a great work up in Antioch. Yes. And what does God send? A famine to Jerusalem. Barnabas and Paul come down in chapter 11. They deliver a gift to these believers in Judea. And right on the heels of that comes a mighty persecution by Herod Antipas I. And where does the church go? Naturally, it goes to where its strength is. They go to God. To prayer. Ephesians 6, 18, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to what end? To keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Many times our prayer is powerless because it lacks the earnestness. Our fervency demonstrates that our heart cares passionately about the things, but it must care about the things that God cares about. And when we get passionate about the things that God cares about, things happen. Notice it says here, many were at that prayer meeting. It says here in the text, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side. Can you imagine this light (laughs) coming into that cell? Peter still doesn't wake up. Isn't that something about prayer? God, would you comfort Peter while he's in prison? (laughs) God just puts him to sleep, and he's just sleeping like a baby. So much so that the angel of the Lord comes in, and the, the room is lit up, and he still doesn't wake up, so he has to poke him in the side. Probably poked him pretty good. Woke him up. Chains fell off his wrists. I mean, what a description that's given to us here. Notice what he says here. Struck him, Peter, on the side and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said unto him, Angel almost walks him through this narrative, doesn't he? Hey, dress yourself and put on your sandals. Well, sandals back in those days were either made out of leather or on the bottoms or, or wooden or, or wood with thongs around them to hold them to the ankles and to the feet. He's telling them exactly what to do. And notice what it says here in verse 8. And he did so, and he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter's obedient to the angel, and he does that. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real but thought he was seeing a vision. (laughs) Sleepwalking, right? Some of you do that quite often, don't you? (laughs) Then notice verse 10, when they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate. You can see how they they were trying to uh, give a, a defense here. It wasn't a wooden gate. This is an iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of his own accord. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. 
And then what happens? When Peter came to himself, I think he fully woke up, right? He said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. By the way, this was not an inside job. This was a heavenly job. We learn in verse number 19, and after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the centuries and ordered that they should be put to death. So this is what happened in this text, right? Notice in verse 12, when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. So what does Peter do? Well, God gives sleep to Peter. He gives obedience to Peter. And then God continues to move in his life, right? He leads him to Mary's house. That's where he ends up. I like Psalm 34 and verse 7, don't you? The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Soldiers and Peter were out like a light, and yet... Peter's released from prison, miraculously. Get up quickly. That's an imperative of urgency. You can call it supernatural sleepwalking, whatever you want to call it, but God delivered him without question, right? And when we get to this text, he comes to Mary's house. What does Peter do? Now, Peter's just gone through three different levels of security, and now he's free on the street, and he goes to Mary's house. This is John Mark's house, right? Maybe there's 40, maybe 50, 60 people in the home, and they're praying. This is a large house in Jerusalem. In the first century, they would have been able to house 40, 50, 60 people in a gathering of that size. The church was praying. I don't believe it just means these 50 or 60 people were praying. No, I think it meant the church in Jerusalem as they were scattered about in different homes praying. These believers were meeting with such expectancy and fervency of prayer and desperation. And what do we see is that the answer of prayer is standing right there at the door. Verse number 13, and when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. So picture a larger house, picture a courtyard, picture a a fence, probably stone going around the house, and this gate, a gate big enough to drive a a, a donkey through with a cart, okay? Quite Quite a large gate, and inside that gate could have even been another door by which you would let single people through. She hears Rhoda. Her name means Rose, right? Oftentimes they would give females names of, of, of things, uh, of, of like, like uh, beautiful names of plants and of flowers. Like we, we talked about uh, Dorcas's name. Her name meant gazelle. How would you like to be named gazelle as a lady? Well, if you're beautiful, you would especially living back in those days. And notice in verse 14, recognizing Peter's voice, he's, he's knocking. Hey, it's the middle of the night, right? He's going to the place where he knows there's activity. Something's happening there, right? And she recognizes Peter's voice. She probably says, who are you? I'm Peter. She recognizes his voice. In her joy, I love that, in her joy, she had a feeling of great pleasure, of inner gladness, of delight. By the way, joy in the New Testament virtually always is used to signify a feeling of happiness that is based on spiritual realities. I think Rhoda, probably as a servant, had been praying too, don't you? I mean, along with everyone else in the church there in that house, she had been praying possibly as well. We don't know. But good theology plus unbelief often leads to fear and confusion. And notice what happens here in verse number 14. In her joy, she did not open the gate. 
She runs inside to tell everyone who's praying inside, hey, guess what? Peter's outside. And they look at her and they start arguing. That's, it's in the imperfect tense in the Greek. So they're going back and forth. And notice what's being said here. She, she ran in and reported that Peter was standing in the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. You go to Mark, that's how the family said about Jesus. You know, Jesus, you're out of your mind. No, they're, they're saying you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, you're out of your mind, or it is his angel. Now, oftentimes you, you, you're, you come into the 21st century and you think, well, what are they thinking by saying it is his angel? What do they mean by that? It's, it's kind of troublesome to modern interpreters when you, when you say it is his angels. Expositors suggest three things. Number one, it's his ghost. A lot of Jews believe that after somebody died, their, their ghost help, you know, just uh, was around for a couple days afterwards. So that's the first interpretation and, but I'd say that's very unlikely. First, they didn't expect Peter to be executed until after Passover. So they wouldn't have probably thought that. Second, the, the term that's used here is the word angelos, which never means a spirit, never means a ghost. Or, number two, theologians would suggest to you that it's his guardian angel, right? It's based on Psalm 91 in verse number 1 and Daniel chapter 10 in verse 21. The guardian angel assumes the appearance of a person he protects and can act on their behalf. So maybe they thought that. Or number three, theologians would suggest, it's his human messenger. That's what they're saying. No, it's just his human messenger. The term angelos literally means a messenger. It means an envoy. So they may have assumed that Rhoda may have heard a messenger, a messenger that Peter sent to the church there in that house and in other house churches that were meeting throughout Jerusalem. So maybe it was his messenger, uh, his, his assistant, that Peter's communicating to them. Perhaps maybe his dying wishes, for instance, or his last minute instructions to the church before he passes away. All right? It's the night before. So they just couldn't believe that Peter was standing at the gate. And so you have this back and forth where Rhoda's saying, no, it's Peter. I heard his voice. He's at the gate. They say, no, you're out of your mind. No, it's Peter. He's at the gate. And they're saying, no, it's just his messenger. It's his angel. So they finally, <laughs> it's interesting. Peter escaped death. He walked out of a high security prison he gets to Mary's house, and they won't let him in. <laughs> I just laughed about that this past week. They finally open the door, right? And what happens? Peter, according to verse number 17, explains answered prayer. Notice in verse 7, but motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, and he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. See, the, the whole church wasn't gathered here. James seems to be the leading elder now in Jerusalem. We'll see him again in Acts chapter 15. He said, share these things. Share what prayer can do. The power of prayer. So, all right. I know we have an annual business meeting. I know we're going to have... We're going to have refreshments afterwards, okay, with cheesecake and, and pie and everything like that. And, and if you're a member, we want to encourage you to come. And if you're not a member, we want to encourage you to come too. It'll be a brief meeting. But we, we wanted just to give you some extra sugar if you want it. And I think we have cheese and crackers as well, you know, for you that don't want the sugar. But uh, let me give you two applications here. This is miraculous. This is God doing what God does. So may I suggest in your prayer life 
this coming week, two things. Number one, ask God what you want and be bold. Oftentimes we temper our requests to protect ourselves from disappointment or to avoid presuming on God and backing God in some hidden corner. Or sometimes we merely pray within the bounds of what we think God may do. And therefore, our prayers are not bold. Pray boldly for what is good. Don't hold back. Don't qualify your quest. God's, threat, God's sovereignty is never threatened. Nor is His goodness compromised because of your big requests. Plead earnestly, supplicate shamelessly before the throne of God's grace for God's will to prevail. God may choose to allow a wicked leader to deprive the church of a godly leader like James the Apostle, but He is God, and God does what He wills always. Pray boldly, but it ought to be with, Hallowed be your name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And number two, trust the sovereignty and goodness of God to prevail. Trust Him. The people in the home of Mary gathered to pray for Peter. We have no idea what they prayed. We don't have no idea for how long they prayed. Probably went into the, the wee night pleading earnestly with God. But I have to believe that some asked for the miraculous release of Peter and God granted it. I stopped demanding years ago for what God has to do in my prayer life. God is much wiser than I am. He is much more powerful than I even think Him to be. He will always do what is right and will always act in a way that honors Himself and is best for my good. You can say, if you have prayed earnestly, even if the results aren't the way you like them to be, the Lord is right in all His ways. Deuteronomy 32.4, The rock, His work is perfect. For all His ways are justice, a God of faithfulness. God is far above us. But friends, God is for us. And He is ready to come to us. Our prayer should be to make God's name treasured as deep as it can possibly be in our hearts. Cause your sovereign authority to hold sway in the deepest parts of my soul, O oh God. We can pray that. Our prayers need to be radically God-exalting. And if they are, God will answer. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, the Bible says. The poet said it like this, I like to go into a place when only God is there. And bending low upon my knees, I bow my head in prayer. No doubt or fear can touch me there. My spirit is at rest. For I am in my Father's house a loved and welcomed guest. If I could ever excite you and challenge you, to be earnest in prayer, it is during this season of the year. There are hearts that are aching because of previous losses that they've occurred in their life, and they're going into a season without a loved one to celebrate Christmas or New Year's with. Would you pray for one another? This is a time of season where it's filled with joy, yes, but it's filled with heartaches and people are, are bound in sin and need to be released and have the joy of the Lord become their strength. This is the season to invite people to come to church. 
This is the season where people are, are most apt to come to a church. Oh, I implore you as the minister of God here at Faith Baptist Church to encourage others to grow, to come to know a saving Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for the brief time we've had this morning to look into your word, to challenge our hearts about what true intercessory prayer is about. It is straining. It is leaning into you, Father. It is requesting from our hearts to you intentionally things and and, and, and enjoying you and telling you how wonderful you are. Oh God, I pray for some of us in this room, it may mean putting time aside every day, maybe from 6 to 6.15, or that time that we travel from our house to work to seek your face in prayer but a dedicated time where we may earnestly speak to you from our heart to your heart so that you might be glorified in all things and the whatever might truly be God-centered in our lives. I wonder if heads are bowed or eyes are closed and with no one looking around. I wonder if you're here this morning. And if you would be honest with yourself, you'd say, you know, preacher, my prayer life has been waning. It's not what it should be. It's not what it used to be. I need to rekindle the coals of, and the flames of fire that once burned in my heart in prayer to God. Preacher, would you pray for me in closing that I would rekindle that once again? Please pray for me. I wonder if you just quietly slip up your hand put it back down for just a moment. Yes, God bless you there, 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 and there, and there, and over here. Yes, God bless you there, and there, and over here. Yes. Please pray for me in closing. Anyone else as I wait for just a moment? Maybe you're here today and you say, preacher, if I died today, I don't know for sure I'd go straight to heaven, but I'd like to know. I'll not point you out and embarrass you anyway, but I'd like to pray for you. From my heart to the heart of God for you this morning. Is there anyone like that here this morning? I don't know for sure if I died that I'd go straight to heaven, but I'd like to know, please pray for me, anyone at all. All right, let's stand to our feet if we would. Let's pray together in closing. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, this is a time where you do your office work in our hearts. For these, Lord, that ask for prayer, I pray for them, Lord, that you would rekindle the fire of prayer and intercessory prayer for one another. Before you, Lord, I pray. Lord, as our pianist plays through a song of just as I am, Lord, may we do business with you in our closing moments of this service. We ask in Christ's name. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed and as our pianist plays, God's speaking to your heart. Maybe you just need to come to the altar and just pray and say, God, please kindle in my heart the kind of prayer I used to pray, the kind of earnestness I used to pray. Maybe right there in your seat, you do your office work with God right now, but have God have his own way in your life right now. Let's leave with that stanza, okay? Just as I am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God. I come, I come. Boy, that's a great place to be, isn't it? Hey, greet one another before you leave. We're going to start our annual business meeting over here. I don't expect it to go more than 20 to 30 minutes. I really don't. 
But if you'd like to join us, please, if you're a member, I want to encourage you to come. If you're, if you're looking at our church and you'd like to see how we run our business meetings, I want to encourage you to come over and uh, join us. Lord bless you. Love you. I hope you have a great day. Thank you.